Uh, hello friends, uh, today we are going to talk about something that is extremely common that we see very commonly around us but we never pay attention to it and we never give it much thought. So what are these common things that we see? So the most common thing that we see uh, is or we hear is the cuckoo speaking. So you hear the call, the beautiful melodious call of the cuckoo. You see the uh, frogs croaking, you see the peacocks dancing, you see goats banging their head together or deers banging their head together. And we never stop and think why these things happen. And being very uh, anthropocentric, being, uh, being humans, we always think, uh, some of us might even think that what is, why is it there? Is it to give us aesthetic pleasure? Are these just activities or games that these animals are indulging in? Is it a simple behavior? Is the cuckoo singing to tell us that the mangoes are ripe? Is it a means to express emotion? Or are there greater complexities and mysteries and science behind it? So the common aim of all these displays, if we observe slightly carefully, is to basically impress and procure a potential mate to find a suitable mate and the best way of doing that is to uh, appease the mate or to impress the mate either by showing strength or intelligence or capabilities. Now the question then comes why do we need a mate? Now the mate is basically needed as is commonly known to further their genome and basically to and why do we need a good mate? Why do we need to impress a certain type of mate? Why not just impress any mate? So that is primarily to increase the fitness levels of their offspring. So their offsprings have better genomes, can survive better, are more attractive and so on and so forth. Now what are the factors which are likely to impress the mate? These factors can be strength, they can be aggression, they can be attractiveness, they can be the resource generating capability. How good a house can, can a potential mate make? How well can they feed us? So there are different factors which may be considered while choosing a mate. But again, the question again arises, why not just mate with anyone at the first available opportunity? Why spend so much energy in sampling multiple males or multiple mates and then deciding which one to be, uh, which one to choose? So why be choosy? Before we answer this question, it is necessary for you all to understand that usually it is the female across the animal world which is choosy and not the male. It is the males which have the task of impressing the female while the female largely sits back and chooses, uh, samples all the males and assesses and whoever she thinks to be suitable, she mates. There are exceptions to this but 99% of the animal world, it is the female which is choosy. Now the question is why be choosy? Simply because each, first of all, each organism wants to have the best for their progeny. Because that is the only way that they are going to pass on their genome successfully. Why only the female is choosy? The female is choosy because she has limited number of eggs she produces. Because her eggs are large in size and therefore there is a limitation on the number that she can produce. However, on the other hand, males have small, uh, uh, small gametes such as sperms. You, we all know that they are tiny and therefore males have a huge number of sperms. And therefore, they can afford to waste because one egg will be, uh, will be fertilized by a single sperm. And therefore, females don't want to waste their eggs, whereas males have enough to waste. And therefore, females will always be choosy when it comes to choosing a mate. And now, all, what has all this selection and choosiness led to in the animal world? It has led to the evolution of beautiful, big decorative tails, colorful uh, feathers or plumage very bright and attractive body parts, dancing, immense impressive dancing and singing skills, even aggressive displays and the ability to procure good territories, good resources and build homes. Or we can say in brief, in a very scientific language, it has led to the development of displayable morphological and behavioral manifestations which indicate individual capabilities or even more briefly, they have led to the evolution of sexual selection. Now this is the topic that I wanted to, cons uh, that we are going to talk about, a topic which is not normally discussed in Indian textbooks per se. And where it is, it is very briefly talked about in terms of mate choice. We will talk about this in further display. Now what sexual selection? 
It was earlier considered similar to natural selection. And natural selection we've been reading on since we were kids. It is the survival of the fittest was proposed by Darwin. That means we've, we've always believed that the ones which are fitter will survive the most. Now, before we move on to the differences between natural and sexual selection, I want to put in a brief note about what the word fitness means. We have been led to believe through all these years that fitness means the one who can uh, walk fastest, jump fastest, run fastest, fly best and so on and so forth. However, this is not fitness. Fitness means ones which can reproduce best and successfully and which can repro reproduce in terms so that their offspring survive the best or are the uh, most strongest. Now, to briefly talk about the differences between natural selection and sexual selection. Natural selection is largely believed to be conservative. It conserves energy, so it is utilitarian and functional. It is also based to solve a problem. Anything which is of no, no use in the body is eventually weeded out or turns into a vestigial organ. It, has, it is sensible, it is economical, it is constructive and it is dull. The sexual selection is exact opposite. It is extremely showy, it is elaborate, it serves no purpose other than impressing an audience. It is whimsical, it is wasteful because it uses up a lot of energy. It can change with um, generations. It is destructive because it uses energy and however, despite all these negatives, it's immensely exciting. John Alcock, one of the foremost workers, says that sexual selection is basically a form of natural selection that occurs when individuals differ in their ability to compete with others for mates or to attract members of the opposite sex. Now, talking about sexual selection, it can be classified into two. There are subcategories, intrasexual selection and intersexual selection. Now, intrasexual selection is basically the competition between the same sexes. That means the opposite sex and we'll be more clear about this. I'll so, when I say the same sexes, I'm going to talk about the males. Now, in this, males basically compete with each other and females stand on the sidelines and just observe the competition. And whoever wins, they get to mate. All the females which are observing will mate maximally with the winner. So, that is intrasexual selection where... Uh, members of the same sex or two males are competing and the females are watching. Here females are passive watchers or passive choosers. Intersexual selection is directly opposite. In this, the female actively choose. Males will not fight with each other but males will display their categories and the female will go and see. The male displays their skills. The female goes and assesses and watches each male. It's almost as if seeing a movie. So you go and watch 10 movies and decide which is the best. So the female here is an active chooser and that is intersexual selection. Now both of these selections, be it intra or be it intersexual selection, can occur at two levels. Pre-copulatory and post-copulatory, that is prior to mating and post-mating. So we will talk about how these two differ. Now in intrasexual selection, which occurs prior to mating, it is very clear there is competition between the males. So these competitions can be for territory, for access to females and the female goes with the winner. Now these are very apparent displays. However, in some organisms, some organisms do not spend so much energy in doing pre-copulatory displays or they're smart animals. They don't spend too much energy in fighting and showing that they're fighting abilities. Here what happens, different males or multiple males will mate with a female and they compete within the female genital tract. Now how do they compete? So if a male senses that a male has previously mated with this female, that the second mating male might give a larger ejaculate. Or they might, or the first mating male might simply plug the female genital tract so that she cannot mate with another male. Right. Or they can destroy the female genital tract. Sometimes the second mating males on having assessed that okay, this female is already mated and recently mated, they release special type of sperms in the female genital tract. Sperms which are designed to kill or block the sperms of the previous male or which act as sprinters. So there are special sperms which will move faster than the sperms of the previous male. So here all the competition that is taking place amongst the males is basically taking place amongst their sperms. And this is known as post-copulatory sexual selection. Now this type of sexual selection usually takes place when males are less and females are more. And 
the winner will get access to all those females. This is the situation in which it takes place and thus is common in promiscuous and polygamous systems. Now we come to intersexual selection. Now intersexual selection, when we talk about it in terms of pre-copulatory, it is indications, they show strength, displays of strength. There will, no, there will not be any active fighting. There will be display of strengths, there will be display of dancing skills, there will be display of provisioning, uh, provisioning capabilities. And so this has led to beautiful colored plumage, beautiful dancing abilities. There, are, there is a bird known as a bower bird. Please look it up on Google. It makes beautiful elaborate homes which it actually decorates in a color scheme. So there will be one bird which decorates completely red, another yellow. They even grow fungus to impress the female or mushroom gardens inside to impress the female. Now in this when it comes to the post copulatory one, because intersexual selection involves females as an active chooser. So even at the post-copulatory level, it is the female which is the active chooser here. So here, a female may accept matings for multiple males or may be forced into mating with multiple males, but it will be the female who decides which sperm will fertilize her eggs. Now she can do this in many ways. She can prematurely interrupt the mating she can deny the male from deeper penetration. She can prevent the transport of sperms to the fertilization site. She can even stop evalu uh, ovulating. She can digest the sperms. She can abort in case of uh, selective fertilization. So here is a list. Uh, uh, there is a list of a number of mechanisms which are known. But here the female actively chooses the sperm which will fertilize her eggs. So this comes to post copulatory intersexual selection. Now this kind of that is intersexual selection takes place when the females are less in number and the males are more. And usually in scenarios where only one male can uh, ultimately father her offspring or father the offspring of the female. Therefore the female here is highly selected. Now females in general need to be very careful in choosing their mates because she invests much in her offspring and to speak about it very briefly male energy goes into looking sexist, uh, sexy and females invest energy in making large healthy offspring. So that is the basis of most of animal behavior that you will study. Now to briefly talk about the different theories that explain sexual selection there are two theories the theory of genetic indicators and the theory of runaway selection. Now the theory of genetic indicators has two sub-theories, the theory of handicaps and the theory of healthy mates or good genes theory. Now the theory of genetic indicators when we talk about handicap, I'll take the example of something that you've very commonly seen which is a, a peacock. So you've seen that peacock males have large elaborate beautiful tails which they spread to dance. Now, it is understandable. If you are carrying a light bag, you are likely to walk faster. If you are carrying a heavy bag, you are likely to walk slower. Now, the bigger the tail, the more likely are they to be selected. But that also makes them more vulnerable. Now, genetic, the, uh, the theory of handicap or handicap theory basically says that any organism which can move around better with even a larger handicap, so if, if there, are, there are two people, one with a 30 kilo bag and the two both with 30 kilo bags, the one which can walk faster is obviously healthier and has better genes. So despite the handicap, if they can perform well, if they can dance well, then they are healthier and therefore they should be chosen as mates. This is the handicap theory. The theory of genetic indicators basically says the use of coloration basically good genes theory or healthy mate theory. Here they use coloration. Now if you've ever watched National Geographic or uh, Discovery Channel carefully, there, there are a lot of programs on baboons and monkeys and there they show that usually the alpha male has a very bright red color on its chest or on its buttocks and this very bright red color indicates the health because if you are ill, you will never have good coloration. You will be pale. So the coloration or the intensity of coloration basically indicates the health of an offspring and therefore by using such indicators the uh, female can choose. So this is about uh, one theory of sexual selection that is using handicaps or using uh, indicators of healthy uh, health and good genes. 
Now, when it comes to runaway selection, which is the other theory. Now, this is a very interesting theory. This is uh, based on chance. So, suppose in a big population of males, one male suddenly due to mutation in the next generation gets a very nice uh, a tail which is different from the other males. So, I am using uh, uh, fishes here as an example. So, if they get a nice elaborate tail. Now, this male is different from the rest of the population and females will tend to prefer because he is different. Is an indicator. So, they tend to prefer and tend to start choosing that male uh, more. Now, what will happen? Because that male is being chosen more and more by females, next generation, all the offspring will have nice big, be, uh, will have tails which are bigger. Now, when every, or most of the people have bigger tails or most of the fishes have bigger tails, then what will happen? There will be immunity. The female will develop a resistance. Okay, okay, everyone has got bigger tails. Why choose anyone? Everyone is equal. In that, then there will be one which will have a further mutation, which will have a slightly bigger tail than the other. That will be preferred. Next generation, all the offspring have slightly bigger tails. And so on and so forth. It's a positive feedback loop. Every generation, the one which has a bigger tail will be chosen. And so the next offspring will have a bigger tail than the previous generation. And so on and so forth. The more female resistance, the more elaborate will be the tails. And therefore, uh, morphological characteristics or procuring characteristics will increase with every generation which is not seen in the case of natural selection. Now to end with a nice interesting tidbit briefly we've talked about animals till now now we're going to talk about sexual selection in humans. Now human sexual selection in human is a very difficult topic to talk because we have changed a lot we have societal uh, expectations which change the way mates are chosen. So we no longer choose mates based on what we have evolved or what are our evolutionary choices. We now choose on the basis of pay packages, fair skin uh, and unfortunately the many different uh, criteria that society has laid out to be. However, there are means of studying what evolution has primed us for and what is the natural preference of humans. So for this we do something which is known as an fMRI which is functional MRI. So in this the uh, individuals are placed in uh, MRI which is recording brain activity and you are shown different um, pictures. So you might be shown pictures of different males doing different actions or different features or different physiques and they just record your brain activity. They do not ask you for your preference. So based on those studies we have found out what do men prefer in women. So men basically prefer smooth skin, a small waist to hip ratios that is wider hips and a smaller waist, youthful appearance and more childlike face because Scientifically, all these factors indicate higher estrogen levels and therefore higher fertility of the female and therefore evolutionarily males are attracted to females which are more fertile. Now, what do women prefer in men? Women basically prefer height, muscularity, broad shoulders, high cheekbones, strong jaws, strong chins and large noses because all of these are indicators of high testosterone level and also the ability because you will you will always have to remember that uh, the uh, early human was a gatherer and a hunter so height muscularity also indicates the ability of the males to uh, procure resources and to protect their flock and that, my friends, is what sexual selection is all about. So next time you see a cuckoo singing, you hear a cuckoo singing or you pe uh, see a peacock dancing, please don't believe it's for your pleasure. There lies a greater purpose and see if you can solve the mysteries further in it. Thank you.